Systems of Numerical Pluralism Chapter 2. Pluralistic Dualism. The System of Descartes. 1. The Beginnings of Modern Philosophy. No one has ever written the history of any period of thought or of life without being greatly puzzled about the point at which to begin it. For whatever event be chosen as the first of the chronicle, this hypothetically first event is conditioned by other events. Every history, therefore, begins at a more or less arbitrary point, and the history of modem philosophy is no exception. The dividing line between the medieval and the modem period is one which it is very hard to draw, in other words, it is impossible to enumerate qualities which mark off absolutely the modem from the medieval epoch. The medieval period seems, however, to be distinguished by these two characters among others. A subordination of thought to revelation, of philosophy to dogma, and a disregard for scientific observation. The first of these attributes of medieval philosophy is prominent in the works of philosophers throughout the period. The medieval, and especially the scholastic, disregard for fact, in particular, for the facts of external nature, is equally apparent. The thinkers of the Middle Ages so immerse themselves in religious doctrine and in the implied problems of ethics, psychology, and demonology, that they could not be affected by the world of nature. Men who speculated with warm concern on the composition of angels' bodies naturally were uninterested in the organs of an animal's body or in the conformation of the physical world. One is fairly safe in the assertion that a growing independence of dogma and a revived interest in natural science mark off the period of modem philosophy from that which precedes it, though even this generalization is distinctly untrue if too rigidly applied. There were men in the medieval period imbued with the modem instincts for independence and for scientific investigation, and there were few philosophers in the 17th century who were untouched by medievalism. But the teaching of the greater number of philosophical thinkers and, thus, the trend of philosophical thought, certainly shows signs of a change toward the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. We are therefore justified in dating modem philosophy from this time. It is a more difficult and a less important task to indicate the very first of modem philosophers. Some historians make the claim for Francis Bacon, but the Novum Organon is a doctrine of the methods of science, rather than a philosophical system. With far more reason, it is often held that the Italian Giordano Bruno was the first of modem philosophers. There is, indeed, no question of Bruno's independence of ecclesiastical authority, of his keen interest in the nature world, and of the depth of his philosophic vision, but vision and interest are often those of poet or seer, not those of scientist or philosopher, and Bruno's works, which are without argumentative form, are mystic rhapsody or unargued insight, rather than ordered philosophy. By some such process of elimination many historians of philosophy have dated the modern period from René Descartes. It is convenient to follow their lead, for unquestionably Descartes' philosophy is of a relatively common type, probably representing, in a way, the philosophy of most of the readers of this book. The revolt of modern philosophy from the influence of the church is curiously illustrated by the outward life and station of Descartes. The philosophers of the medieval period had been priests or monks, or, at least, university teachers, but Descartes started out as courtier and man of the world, and though he remained throughout his life an obedient son of the church, he never occupied an ecclesiastical or an academic office. His immediate preparation for the career of mathematician and philosopher consisted of four years of foreign military service, chiefly spent in the Netherlands and in Bohemia, in search, as he says, for the knowledge which could be found in the great book of the world. At the end of this period, intellectual interests asserted supreme control over Descartes' outward life. I was in Germany, he writes, and returning from the coronation of the emperor, the coming of winter detained me in a place where, having no conversation to divert me, and no cares or passions to trouble me, I spent the day, shut up alone in a tent where I had leisure to entertain myself with my thoughts. These thoughts concerned themselves with the deepest problems of reality, their immediate outcome was the stirring of philosophic doubt in the mind of Descartes, his conviction that he had too uncritically adopted the opinions of his teachers, and his resolve to build up for himself an independent philosophic system. The criterion of truth which he adopted was the following, never to receive as true anything which I did not evidently know to be true. And he proposed to gain this evident knowledge by a method formulated in the following precepts. To divide my difficulties to conduct my thoughts in order to review my conclusions. These statements of Descartes' purpose make it evident that he adopts, on the one hand, the three acknowledged methods of scientific thought, analysis, logical reasoning, and verification, and, on the other hand, the philosopher's attitude as well, dissatisfaction with conclusions that lack utter certainty. This desire for truth gives way, however, to a positive philosophical doctrine. From a study of this teaching it will appear that Descartes gains, by his philosophic reflection and reasoning, a conception familiar to us all. He regards the universe as made up of spirits, or selves, and of bodies, inorganic and organic. Supreme over all the finite or limited spirits, he teaches, and over all the bodies is an infinite and perfect spirit, God. 
Descartes' philosophical system is evidently, therefore, pluralistic both from the qualitative and from the numerical standpoint. It is qualitatively pluralistic or, more specifically, dualistic, in that it teaches that there are precisely two kinds of reality, spiritual and material. It is numerically pluralistic through its teaching that, of each of these classes of reality, there are innumerable examples or instances, that each sort of reality is embodied, as it were, in an indefinite number of specific individuals, or things. The effort will be made in this chapter, first, to outline this system, and then to estimate it. Criticism will be postponed till the doctrine is fully stated, in the hope that a sympathetic understanding of Descartes' opinions may precede the attempt to estimate their value. 2. The Philosophical System of Descartes. A. The Preparation for Philosophy. Universal Doubt. At the very outset of his philosophical study, Descartes finds his way barred by a formidable difficulty. Philosophy is the attempt by reasoning to reach a perfect certainty, and therefore the student of philosophy must start from some admitted fact, from some perfect certainty, however small. But Descartes discovers, when he searches experience for some truth unambiguously certain and incapable of being doubted, that he can find not one. Of all that he has been taught to believe there is nothing whose reality may not be questioned. His quest for some small certainty leaves him without any certainty on any subject, in other words, he finds it necessary to doubt everything. At first sight Descartes' attitude of universal doubt seems absurd. It is possible, we shall most of us admit, to question the existence of the unseen and the unexperienced, but how can anyone in his senses doubt the reality of the things he himself touches, sees, and hears, the existence of objects of the physical world? Descartes has a ready answer to this question. We cannot be absolutely certain, he teaches, of the existence of the things we perceive, for we know that our senses sometimes mislead us. All he says, that I have up to this moment accepted as possessed of the highest truth and certainty, I have learned either from or through my senses. But the senses have sometimes misled us, I have frequently observed that towers, which at a distance seem round, appear square when more closely viewed, and that colossal figures, raised on the summits of these towers, look like small statues when viewed from the bottom of them. Also, I have sometimes been informed by persons whose arms or legs have been amputated, that they still occasionally seem to feel pain in that part of the body which they have lost. These examples and innumerable others like them, are sufficient to prove the fallaciousness of the senses. And Descartes continues, it is the part of prudence not to place absolute confidence in that by which we may have even once been deceived. There is no escape from this argument of Descartes. Surely we have all heard footsteps, when, as we have later discovered, there was no one near, and we have met in our dreams people as vivid as any in so-called waking life, and yet these illusory sounds in these dream people are admitted to be unreal. And it is possible, however unlikely, that I am dreaming at this very instant, or that the pen I grasp, the words I hear, are mere illusions. So far, Descartes has proved only the uncertainty of objects known through sense perception. But our doubt, he believes, is of wider extent. It is possible to doubt of every object of knowledge. Even mathematical truths concerning body, figure, extension, motion, and place may be merely fictions of my mind. This follows, he teaches, because every human knower is a finite and a limited being. How then can the human knower be sure that he is not deceived in his most profound conviction? He does not know everything, how can he be certain that he knows anything? In truth he may be, at every point, in error. Descartes does not teach, it will be noticed, that we are in error in all that we believe, he insists merely that we may be in error. In other words, he does not deny, but he doubts, the reality of everything. And in this situation, as he clearly recognizes, philosophy is impossible. b. The implication of doubt. The existence of myself. The hopelessness of Descartes' situation is suddenly relieved by his discovery of one unquestioned truth. That he himself exists. He cannot doubt this, for doubt itself would be impossible if he did not exist. I suppose myself to be deceived he exclaims, doubtless then I exist, since I am deceived. Herewith Descartes reaches the real starting point of his philosophical system, the certainty which is immediately evident to each one of us, namely, the existence of myself. I had the persuasion he says, that there was absolutely nothing in the world, that there was no sky and no earth, neither minds nor bodies. Was I not, then, at the same time persuaded that I did not exist? Far from it, I assuredly existed, since I was persuaded. It is, indeed, impossible that I am nothing, so long as I shall be conscious that I am something, this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true each time it is expressed by me or conceived in my mind. In other words, Descartes asserts that he is immediately certain of his own existence, and that the certainty of a self which doubts is implied by every doubt, even the most radical. This doubting self, Descartes proceeds to describe. It is, first of all, conscious, it is known in doubting, believing, in a word, in thinking for Descartes understands by the word thought, cogitatio, 
all that which so takes place in us that we of ourselves are immediately conscious of it, and accordingly not only understanding, willing, imagining, but even perceiving. Furthermore, the self is not identical with any one of its thoughts or doubts, in other words, with any one of its ideas, or even with the sum of them. Descartes expresses this by the teaching that there is a self, soul, or mind, which is ideas and is conscious. I am, he says, precisely speaking, a thinking thing, a mind. In the third place, Descartes teaches, the self is free. Of this freedom, he believes that he is directly conscious. I experience, he says, the freedom of choice, I am conscious of will, so ample and extended as to be superior to all limits. The conception of the freedom of the self will be considered in more detail in another connection. It is most important to realize the meaning of this doctrine of the self. For if Descartes' preliminary doubt is justified, the certainty of myself is the starting point of every philosophy, and not of Descartes only. It is true that philosophy was defined as the attempt to discover the irreducible nature of anything, but if I must begin by doubting everything save my own existence, then the truth that I am must be my point of departure in the search for ultimate reality. For as Descartes and Saint Augustine long before him pointed out, it is the one certainty immediately evident in the very act of doubting. To be uncertain is to be conscious, and consciousness inevitably implies the existence of somebody being conscious. As surely then as doubt or uncertainty exists on any subject, so surely a conscious doubting self exists. The nature of this knowledge of oneself, the foundation stone of Descartes' system, should be carefully defined. In a sense, of course, it is immediate or unreasoned knowledge, the unreflective sense of one's own existence which is common to us all. Yet, as taken up into philosophy, this knowledge is not instinctive uncritical self-consciousness. For it has been reasoned about, though itself immediate, it has been shown to be implied in all doubt. So viewed, it is distinguished from that uncritical consciousness of self which belongs to the everyday life, and which often may be in no wise distinguished by its degree of conviction from one's persuasion of the existence of physical objects. C. The inference from my own existence. The existence of God. The persistent student of philosophy, the seeker for a knowledge of the irreducible all of reality, may not rest contented when he has established, by reasoning, this one conviction of his own existence. For it is evident that whatever is required or implied by this truth, whatever, in other words, may be demonstrated from it, must share in its certainty. Thus, the next question of the philosopher, who starts with Descartes' conviction of his own existence, is the following. May I demonstrate from my own existence the existence of any other reality? To this question Descartes worked out a definite answer. As will appear, he concluded that, reasoning from his own existence, he could demonstrate the existence of God, and that, reasoning from God's existence, he could prove the existence of the physical world. Evidently, then, Descartes' conception of God's nature and his arguments for God's existence are of greatest significance to a student of his system. It is enough, for the present, to say that Descartes means by God a perfect, that is, a complete, spirit or self. A being all-powerful, all-wise, all-good, for the existence of God, he has four arguments and these are of two main types. Two ontological arguments, that is, arguments from the character of the conception of God's nature, and two causal arguments. The statement of these arguments, which follows, has been made as simple and as clear as possible. The arguments are, nonetheless, full of complications, and will claim the close attention of the untrained reader. The critical consideration of them is postponed to a later section. The point of departure, it will be remembered, always is the clear and evident knowledge of one's own existence. The first of the ontological arguments may be stated thus. That of which I have a consciousness as clear as my consciousness of myself, must exist. But I am as clearly conscious of God as of myself, hence God exists. In Descartes' own words, whatever mode of probation I adopt, it always returns to this, that it is only the things I clearly and distinctly conceive, which have the power of completely persuading me, and with respect to God, I know nothing sooner than the existence of a supreme being, or of God. And although the right conception of this truth has cost me much close thinking, I feel as assured of it as of what I deem most certain. The second of Descartes' ontological arguments is many times restated in his works, but it is not original with him. It was first formulated by the medieval philosopher, Saint Anselm, and is always known as Anselm's argument for the existence of God. In brief, as given by Descartes, it is the following. The idea of God is the idea of an all-perfect being. But to perfection, or completeness, belong all attributes. Power, goodness, knowledge, and also existence. Therefore God, of necessity, exists. When the mind says Descartes, reviews the different ideas that are in it, it discovers what is by far the chief among them, that of a being omniscient, all-powerful, and absolutely perfect, and it observes that in this idea there is contained not only possible and contingent existence, as in the ideas of all other things which it clearly perceives, but existence absolutely necessary and eternal. 
and just as because, for example, the equality of its three angles to two right angles is necessarily comprised in the idea of a triangle, the mind is firmly persuaded that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles, so, from its perceiving necessary and eternal existence, to be comprised in the idea which it has of an all-perfect being, it ought manifestly to conclude that this all-perfect being exists. Descartes' causal arguments for God's existence may both be summarized in the following propositions. I know that I exist and that I am a finite incorporeal being, possessed of the idea of God, an infinite and perfect being. But both I myself and my idea of God must have been caused by a being capable of creating and preserving me, and the idea of God within me. And only an infinite and perfect being can be the real or ultimate cause of me, and of this idea of God. Therefore such an infinite being, God, exists. Before stating these arguments with the care they demand, it is important to analyze the concept of causality on which they are based. Descartes' fundamental principle of causality is the doctrine that every finite reality has some cause. This conviction is implied by almost every statement which he makes about causality. In the second place, Descartes believes that the cause of every finite reality is a conserving cause, that is to say, that it continues while its effect continues. In other words, he denies the possibility that a cause should cease before its effect ceases. Finally, Descartes holds that each finite reality has a cause which is more than finite, which is, in other words, self-existent ultimate total and efficient. Such a cause has, he teaches, two essential characters, it has at least as much reality as its effect, and it is non-ideal, or in Descartes' terminology formal, that is, it is no mere idea. Both Descartes' causal arguments for the existence of an all-perfect God are based, as will appear, upon the principles just formulated, in other words, upon the necessity of, 1, some cause of every finite reality, which is, 2, a conserving cause and, 3, a more than finite, in fact, an ultimate cause, and, because ultimate, a, formal or real, and, b, as perfect as its effect. The first of the causal arguments for God's existence, in which Descartes embodies these principles, if not entirely original with Descartes, is so forcibly stated in his discussions of God's existence that it is justly known as the Cartesian argument. In brief, it is this. An all-perfect being, God, must exist. For I have the idea of such an all-perfect being, this idea must have some cause, I, a finite being, could not cause in myself this idea of an infinite God, and indeed God alone is capable of producing this idea of God which unquestionably I possess. In Descartes' own words the argument is as follows. There, remains, the idea of God, in which I must consider whether there is anything which cannot be supposed to originate with myself. By the name God, I understand a substance infinite, independent, all-knowing, all-powerful, and by which I myself, and every other thing which exists, if any such there be, were created. But these properties are so great and excellent that, it is absolutely necessary to conclude, that God exists. For I should not, have the idea of an infinite substance, seeing I am a finite being, unless it were given me by some substance in reality infinite. This argument explicitly involves all the features of Descartes' conception of cause, save the doctrine that a cause must conserve its effect. It first of all assumes that my idea of God must have some cause, in the next place, it assumes that the cause must be ultimate, and therefore real being, or in Descartes' term, formal reality, and not a mere idea, in Descartes' words, it cannot be objective reality. In order Descartes says, that an idea may contain this objective ideal reality, rather than that, it must doubtless derive it from some cause in which is found at least as much formal not ideal reality, as the idea contains of objective ideal. In other words, every idea is, of necessity, caused by something which is more real than any idea. This argument that God exists is inevitable cause of the idea of God implies, finally, that the ultimate cause cannot be less perfect than its effect. Hence, Descartes argues, I cannot myself be the cause of this idea of God, seeing that I am not infinitely powerful and good. It follows from these causal principles, that an infinite God must exist to cause the idea of God. Because we discover in our mind Descartes says, the idea of God, or of an all-perfect being, we have a right to inquire into the source whence we derive it, and we shall discover that the perfections it represents are so immense as to render it quite certain that we could only derive it from an all-perfect being, that is, from a God really existing. For it is not only manifest by the natural light that nothing cannot be the cause of anything whatever, and that the more perfect cannot arise from the less perfect, but also that it is impossible we can have the idea or representation of anything whatever, unless there be somewhere, an original which comprises, in reality, all the perfections that are thus represented to us, but as we do not in any way find in ourselves those absolute perfections of which we have the idea, we must conclude that they exist in some nature different from ours, that is, in God. This argument is of unquestioned validity, if once Descartes' conception of cause be accepted, and he, therefore, needs no other causal argument for God's existence. 
Nonetheless, he formulates another argument, of some complexity, to prove that God must exist, not merely as cause of my idea of God, but as cause of me. Descartes' proof of this is by elimination. It is evident that there must be some cause of me, and Descartes seeks to disprove the possibility that any other being, save God, could be the cause of me. 1. I am not, in the first place, cause of myself. 4. If I were, I must be conscious of this causality, whereas I am conscious of no such power, and thereby I manifestly know that I am dependent on some being different from myself. Moreover, if I were myself the author of my being I should doubt of nothing, I should desire nothing, and, in fine, no perfection would be wanting to me, for I should have bestowed upon myself every perfection of which I possess the idea, and I should thus be God. Both these arguments are based on my immediate consciousness of my own limited powers and defects, though the latter may be derived, also, from the principle that the effect may be no more perfect than the cause. 2. It is equally certain that no being less perfect than God could have produced me. Descartes argues this mainly on two grounds. No finite being, in the first place, can be the ultimate cause of me, for every finite being has itself to be explained by a cause outside itself. Thus a finite being could only be the proximate or immediate, not the ultimate, cause of me, and concerning such a proximate, finite, cause, Descartes says, we should rightly demand again, whether it exists of itself or through some other, until, from stage to stage, we at length arrive at an ultimate cause, which will be God. In the second place, even granting that some other cause less perfect than God, that is, some finite cause, were the cause which created me, it could not be the cause which conserves me during every moment of my conscious life. But according to Descartes' conception of causality, every real cause, it will be remembered, must be a conserving cause. For the cessation of a cause would imply, Descartes says, that one moment of time could be dependent on a previous moment of time, and this, he declares, is impossible. The whole time of my life, he says, may be divided into an infinity of parts, each of which is in no way dependent on any other, and accordingly, because I was in existence a short time ago, it does not follow that I must now exist, unless in this moment some cause creates me anew as it were, that is, conserve me. Now no finite cause can be conceived as existing, not merely through my life, but through the life of the succession of finite beings. Therefore the conserving cause of me must be an infinite, not a finite, cause. Evidently these different arguments, against the possibility that a being less than God has produced me, have involved not only the principle that every limited reality has a cause, but also the conviction that this cause is more than finite, in truth that it is ultimate, that it is a conserving cause, and that it is no less perfect than its effect. This last principle is at the root of Descartes' argument against the hypothesis which remains to be eliminated. It has been shown that neither I myself nor any being less than God can cause me. It is, however, three, still conceivable that a group of beings, each of them less than God, might produce me. Descartes outlines this possibility and argues against it in the following way. Nor can it, he says, be supposed that several causes concurred in my production, and that from one I received the idea of one of the perfections which I attribute to the deity, and from another the idea of some other, and thus that all those perfections are indeed found somewhere in the universe, but do not all exist together in a single being who is God, for, on the contrary, the unity, the simplicity or inseparability of all the properties of deity, is one of the chief perfections I conceive him to possess, and the idea of this unity of all the perfections of deity, could certainly not be put into my mind by any cause, from which I did not likewise receive the ideas of all the other perfections, for no power could enable me to embrace them in an inseparable unity, without at the same time giving me the knowledge of what they were. Obviously the heart of this reasoning is the principle that a cause must be no less perfect than its effect. For this reason, Descartes teaches, no composite cause could produce in me the idea which I certainly have of an infinite simple being, and it follows that the cause of me is one ultimate being, resembling in its unity, as well as in its other qualities, the idea of itself that it produces in me. This disproof of the possibility that a group of beings produced me of course carries with it the disproof of the doctrine that my parents caused me. Descartes, however, adds, in opposition to this doctrine, the statement that one's parents are the causes only of bodily dispositions, not of mind. Descartes has, therefore, argued that neither I myself, nor any other being less than God, nor any group of beings, could have caused me. Only one other cause of my existence is possible. I must believe that God exists, for every finite reality must have a cause, and only God could cause that finite reality, myself, of whose existence I am immediately certain. In arguing for God's existence, Descartes has indicated his conception of God's nature. It is summed up in the definition of God as a being, absolutely perfect. From his absoluteness, follows his entire self-dependence. He is the absolute substance which stands in need of no other thing in order to its existence. From his perfection follow the positive characters. Omniscience, omnipotence, and absolute goodness. 
from his absolute perfection, also, according to Descartes, there result three negative characters. These are the following. In the first place, God is not corporeal, for, since extension constitutes the nature of body, and since divisibility is included in local extension, and this indicates imperfection, it is certain that God is not body. Furthermore, God does not perceive by means of senses, since in every sense there is passivity which indicates dependency, we must conclude Descartes says, that God is in no manner possessed of senses, and that he only understands and wills, that he does not, however, like us, understand and will by acts in any way distinct, but that he always by an act that is one, identical, and the simplest possible, understands, wills, and operates all, that is, all things that in reality exist for he does not will the evil of sin, seeing this is but the negation of being. From God's perfect goodness it follows, finally, that God does not deceive. It is impossible, Descartes says, for him ever to deceive me, for in all fraud and deceit, there is a certain imperfection, and, although it may seem that the ability to deceive is a mark of subtlety or power, yet the will testifies without doubt of malice or weakness, and such accordingly cannot be found in God. d. The consequence of God's existence. The existence of corporeal things and of finite selves. Descartes starts out by doubting everything. In the doubt of himself he finds the certainty of his own existence. From the existence of himself he demonstrates, as he believes, the existence of an all-perfect God. From this certainty of the existence of an all-powerful and absolutely good God, he goes on to demonstrate the existence of corporeal, or material, things. He argues mainly from the impossibility that a good God should deceive me. I doubtless possess sense perceptions, and I have a clear consciousness that these ideas are caused by real objects external to me and as God has given me, a very strong inclination to believe that those ideas arise from corporeal objects, I do not see Descartes says, how he could be vindicated from the charge of deceit, if in truth they proceeded from any other source, or were produced by other causes than corporeal things, and accordingly, it must be concluded, that corporeal objects exist. The same argument, it may be observed, would serve to prove the existence of limited, or finite, spirits other than myself. Descartes assumes their existence, but he might have argued it, for I surely conceive the existence of human beings as clearly and distinctly as that of corporeal objects, and the absolutely good God could not be vindicated from the charge of deceit, if so distinct a consciousness were a mere illusion. Descartes has a second, though subordinate, argument for the existence of corporeal objects. It is the argument, later emphasized by the English philosopher Locke, on which most of us depend when we are challenged to prove the reality of external things, trees or stones, for instance, they must exist, we say, else we should never have these perceptions of them. My imaginations I control as I will, even my dreams are copies of my previous experience, but my percepts force themselves upon me, I can neither change nor modify them, they are unavoidable. Evidently then real objects must exist outside me to force on me these impressions of themselves. Descartes makes use of this argument for the reality of physical things. I am directly conscious of hardness, heat, and the other tactile qualities, light, colors, odors, tastes, and sounds. And assuredly he says, it was not without reason that I thought I perceived certain objects wholly different from my thought, namely, bodies from which those ideas proceeded, for I was conscious that the ideas were presented to me without my consent being required, so that I could not perceive any object, however desirous I might be, unless it were present to the organ of sense, and it was wholly out of my power not to perceive it when it was thus present and because the ideas I perceived by the senses were much more lively and clear, and even, in their own way, more distinct than any of those I could of myself frame by meditation, it seemed that they could not have proceeded from myself, and must therefore have been caused in me by some other objects, and as of those objects themselves, I had no knowledge beyond what the ideas themselves gave me, nothing was so likely to occur to my mind as the supposition that the objects were similar to the ideas which they had caused. This second argument for the existence of material things is based on an undoubted fact, that our sense perception is forced upon us, that we must see and smell and hear what we do. It follows that we do not ourselves voluntarily cause these sense perceptions, and it is evidently natural for us to refer them to corporeal objects wholly different from any thought. Of the real existence of these objects, however, we can be assured only if we know that our inferences are to be trusted, in other words, if we are sure that God does not deceive us. So the second argument for the existence of corporeal things presupposes the first argument. Thus Descartes argues for the existence of corporeal objects. But precisely what, it must next be asked, does he mean by the corporeal object? It is natural to answer that a corporeal object, a material thing, is a real being possessed of qualities corresponding to our sensations. That a corporeal rose, for example, is red and fragrant and smooth and the like. Descartes, however, teaches that the corporeal objects whose existence he holds so certain are not the colored, fragrant, sounding things which we believe ourselves to perceive. 
On the contrary, he says, real, material things are simply extended things. They have no color, or fragrance, or texture, or resistance, they have mere shape and figure and extent. The hardness and color and the rest, which we no doubt attribute to things outside us, really are mere sensations in us, due to the different figures and motions of extended bodies. The nature of body Descartes says, consists not in weight, hardness, color, and the like, but in extension alone, in its being a substance extended in length, breadth, and height. Dot the real rose, in other words, has no corporeal quality save its shape and size and movement. To our sensations of its redness and fragrance, there correspond no similar qualities in the rose itself, these sensations are caused by modifications of the real extension of bodies, that is to say, the sensations are caused by motions of the particles of the real extended body. Thus the world of external things, as conceived by Descartes, is a world of extended and moving, but of uncolored odorless soundless things. And different to such a world is from the world of objects which we suppose ourselves to see and touch, it is, we must remember, precisely the sort of physical world which the science of our own time assumes. According to the teaching of the physicists, our sensations of light and of color, are due to the vibrations of colorless, and indeed of invisible, ether waves, our sound sensations are produced by moving air vibrations, our tastes and smells are due, finally, to molecular and atomic movements. The natural science of Descartes' day conceived the physical world in a closely allied fashion, as a world of extended bodies and of moving particles, therefore, Descartes, in this doctrine of extension as the only quality of objects, is simply adopting the widest generalization of the science of his time. But, of course, Descartes does not make, without argument, the assumption that external things have only one quality, extension, and that the other sensible qualities are mere sensations in us, produced by the modifications of extended bodies. He offers, in fact, four arguments for this conclusion, and these must now be outlined. 1. Descartes urges, first, that extension is the only bodily attribute which is clearly apprehended. By clear apprehension Descartes always means the kind of consciousness which the mathematician has, and evidently, extension is the only one of the qualities of a body which can be mathematically known. The rest, weight, color, and all the other qualities of this sort are thought with obscurity and confusion. 2. It is certain also, Descartes thinks, that the qualities, except extension, of corporeal substances, are not necessary to the nature of body. With respect to hardness for example, we know nothing of it by sense farther than that the parts of hard bodies resist the motion of our hands on coming into contact with them, but if every time our hands move towards any part, all the bodies in that place receded as quickly as our hands approached, we should never feel hardness, and yet we have no reason to believe the bodies which might thus recede would on this account, lose that which makes them bodies. The nature of body does not, therefore, consist in hardness. 3. In the third place, Descartes points out, this theory that motion may produce in us sensations, of color, odor, and the like, is in accord with the admitted fact that certain sensations, those in particular of pain and of titillation, are due to moving things. The motion merely he says, of a sword cutting a part of our skin causes pain. And it is certain that the sensation of pain is not less different from the motion that causes it, than are the sensations we have of color, sound, odor, or taste. On this ground we may conclude that our mind is of such a nature that the motions alone of certain bodies can also easily excite in it all the other sensations, as the motion of a sword excites in it the sensation of pain. 4. It is probable, Descartes argues finally, that the remote physical causes of sensation are movements of extended things, since it is everywhere admitted that the immediate physiological, or bodily, conditions of all sensations, are local motions of the nerves and brain organs. There is no reason, Descartes believes, to think that anything at all, reaches the brain besides the local motion of the nerves themselves. And we see that local motion alone causes in us not only the sensation of titillation and of pain, but also of fight and sounds. For if we receive a blow on the eye of sufficient force to cause the vibration of the stroke to reach the retina, we see numerous sparks of fire, and when we stop our ear with our finger, we hear a humming sound, the cause of which can only proceed from the agitation of the air that is shut up within it. E. Descartes' Summary of His Positive Teaching The Substance Doctrine This account of Descartes' doctrine has followed mainly his meditations. In the end of Part 1 of that later work, The Principles of Philosophy from which quotation has repeatedly been made, Descartes summarized and supplemented his metaphysical system, in a terminology resembling that of medieval philosophy, as a doctrine of substances. This form of his teaching must now be outlined, partly because it forcibly restates the essentials of Descartes' doctrine, as already considered, partly because it brings out more clearly his conception of matter, and finally, because it is the form in which Descartes' doctrine exerted a strong influence on the course of philosophical thought.
by substance in the strict sense of the term, is meant, Descartes says, a thing which exists in such a way as to stand in need of no other thing in order to its existence. Evidently, if substance be thus defined, there can be conceived but one substance, and that is God. The absoluteness of God is accordingly taught by Descartes in the doctrine that God is substance. But besides the one absolutely independent substance, there exist, as Descartes believes that he has found, realities directly dependent on God, and these Descartes calls created substances. Of these there are two sorts, corporeal and thinking substances. Every thinking substance has one principal property which constitutes its nature or essence, namely consciousness, or thinking. Every corporeal substance also has a principal attribute extension. For every other thing. Descartes says, which can be attributed to body presupposes extension. Corporeal as well as thinking things are termed substances because they stand in need of nothing but the concourse of God. In other words, though dependent on God, they are relatively self-sufficient. The thinking substance, myself, for example, is fundamental to, and in the sense independent of, its own thoughts and ideas, it is also, Descartes teaches, independent of corporeal substances. Our mind, he says, is of a nature entirely independent of the body. It must be noted that Descartes, though he constantly refers to many substances, also speaks of two substances, thought and matter. In these passages, however, he very clearly means by substance kind or class of substance. Because of a misunderstanding of his teaching at this point, Descartes has sometimes been unjustly accused of attributing a fictitious reality to a mere general notion. The belief that a created substance is independent save of God leads Descartes, as has appeared, to conclude that every such created substance is independent of every other, and in particular that any extended substance is independent of any thinking substance, and vice versa. One of the corollaries of this doctrine is of especial importance. For from the independence, save on God, of each created substance, it follows obviously that a bodily organism is uninfluenced by what is called its soul. Everybody, animal or human, is consequently a mere extended thing, a machine subject only to mechanical, or, more strictly, to mathematical, laws. Descartes does not shrink from this conclusion in its application to animals. An animal, he teaches, is an automaton, a mere body without soul, a machine made by the hands of God. Were there machines, he says, exactly resembling in organs and outward form an ape and any other irrational animal, we could have no means of knowing that they were in any respect of a different nature from these animals. But Descartes could not bring himself to regard the human body as utterly independent of spirit. Both the logic of his substance doctrine and the analogy with his teaching about animals require this conclusion, yet he teaches that the reasonable soul is joined and united to the body in order to have sensations and appetites. In perception, the soul is affected by the bodily changes due to the stimulus of external objects, and by volition the soul or spirit causes bodily movements. Descartes, however, reduces to its lowest terms this influence of body on soul and of soul on body. He teaches that the soul affects only the direction, never the amount, of bodily movement, and that the mind immediately influences the body at one small point only, the pineal gland of the brain. A complete account of Descartes' teaching would include at this point a sketch of his philosophy of nature. Descartes' metaphysics is so deeply spiritualistic that the student is unprepared for his rigidly mechanistic conception of the physical universe. The truth is, however, that the complete qualitative dualism of Descartes' system, the teaching that spirit is radically different from matter, and that a finite spirit is independent of its body, left Descartes free to conceive the physical universe as unhampered by spiritual law. It has already appeared that he everywhere teaches that the human body is no more nor less than a machine. And somewhat as the human body is influenced at one point only by its spirit so, Descartes teaches, the world might conceivably have been created, once for all, by God as a chaotic mass, and might have attained its present state by the working out of purely mechanical laws. If God, he says, were now to create, enough matter to make the world in the form of a confused chaos, and if he were then to leave this chaos to act according to the laws which he has established, then this chaotic matter would so dispose and order itself as to form planets, sun, fixed stars, and earth. The result, Descartes concludes, would be a world entirely similar to ours. Not only inorganic bodies and plants, but even animal bodies might have come into being through the succession of natural effects upon their causes. It is unnecessary to point out that this conception of the possible continuity of complex with simple organism and of organism with an organic form, is none other than the theory at the basis of modern evolutionary science. And though Descartes, after outlining this daring hypothesis, still asserts, in conformity with the teaching of the Church, that the world was created by God from the beginning with all its perfections, we are nonetheless justified in agreeing with Buffon that it is Descartes who takes the first step toward that mechanistic conception of the universe, which has mainly dominated natural science since his day. 3. Critical Estimate of Descartes' System 
this study of Descartes has, up to this point, concerned itself to outline clearly his philosophical theory and to make distinct the arguments by which he sought to establish it. But the student of philosophy has not merely the task of understanding a metaphysical system, it is his duty, also, to estimate it critically, to challenge its assertions, to scrutinize its arguments. And before this critical estimate is undertaken, a warning sounded in the preface of this book must be emphatically repeated. Adequate criticism at this stage of philosophical study is impossible. If it is true, as will be argued, that Descartes did not fully understand, in all their bearings, the problems which he discussed, still more is it true that without a study of other systems, no one is fitted to criticize Descartes. A. The adequate basis of Descartes' system. My existence. The writer of this book believes, as firmly as Descartes believed, that I as conscious self exist, and that I know my own existence, not only in knowing anything whatever, but even in doubting everything. In a later chapter the effort will be made to show that the critics who have questioned the existence of a self really have throughout implied and assumed it. For the present it will be taken for granted that the reader either admits or grants for argument's sake Descartes' foundation teaching. That I myself exist. But while insisting on the significance and the truth of Descartes' teaching, I doubt and in doubting I exist, it is certainly possible to criticize, at certain points, his conception of the I or self. He is right in insisting that the nature of a self is to be conscious, and that any self is more than a mere series of ideas. But he does not adequately conceive the relation of a self, or soul, either to external objects or to God. In particular, Descartes assumes without discussion the freedom of the self, or soul. He never realizes, or at least he never solves, the difficulty involved in conceiving that God is all-powerful and all-good, and yet that finite selves have the freedom to make mistakes and to commit sin. B. Descartes' inadequate arguments for God's existence. From his own existence, Descartes infers that of an all-perfect God. The arguments on which he bases this conclusion must be scrutinized with special care, for, as has been shown, the existence of a perfect God is to Descartes the warrant for all other reality. The existence of God is thus, as it were, the second foundation stone of Descartes' system. Every other conclusion is derived, not from the certainty implied in every doubt of his own existence, but from the demonstrated existence of God. One by one, therefore, it will be wise to examine Descartes' arguments for God's existence. According to the first of the ontological arguments, God is known to exist because I conceive him as clearly as I conceive myself. Obviously the argument involves the following premises. 1. That God is clearly conceived and 2. That clear conception is a guarantee of truth. The argument is sometimes criticized by challenging the assertion that God can be clearly and distinctly conceived. Indeed, Descartes himself admits that he may not comprehend the nature of God, though in the same breath he says that we know clearly God's perfections. But whatever the outcome of this criticism, it will become evident that the second premise of the argument is of doubtful validity. The best clue to Descartes' meaning is gained by considering his two examples of an object of clear conception, one, myself and, two, a mathematical truth, such as two plus three equals five. Now it has already appeared that I assert my own existence on the ground that it is implied in the doubt or denial of it. Similarly, I am sure of the existence, that is of the actual occurrence in my thought, of a mathematical judgment or of a mathematical idea, for example, the concept of a triangle, or indeed of any idea, and I have this certainty because the judgment or the idea perforce occurs to me, while I am doubting or denying it. There is, it is true, another type of mathematical certainty, I am sure that 2 plus 3 equals 5, not 6 or 7, because I am directly conscious of the identity of 2 plus 3 and 5. But the assertion, that God exists, obviously has not the certainty attaching to an identical proposition, nor is the existence of God directly implied in the denial of it. Therefore, whatever the sense in which Descartes is clearly and distinctly conscious of God, such consciousness is not parallel with the clear conception of myself, and of mathematical truth s and cannot, on the sole ground of this analogy, be supposed to imply the existence of God. According to the second ontological argument, God is known to exist because the conception of God is that of an all-perfect being, and because perfection, that is, completeness, means the possession of all attributes, therefore of existence. A strong objection may be brought forward to this teaching. The argument, it may be said, makes too little of the distinction between conception, or idea, and existence. Unquestionably the idea of God includes the idea of really existing, but the idea of real existence, like any other idea, does not, it is pointed out, carry with its actual existence. I may, for instance, carry out in imagination the demonstration of a geometrical proposition concerning the angles of a triangle. But though I clearly visualize a perfect triangle, this does not prove that the triangle has actual existence. 
So, though Descartes is right in the teaching that the idea of existence belongs to the idea of God as certainly as the idea of equality to two right angles, is comprised in the idea of a triangle he may, nevertheless, be unjustified in his conclusion that the idea of an existing God inevitably implies an existing God. It would be unjust to Descartes to suppose that this difficulty did not occur to him. Though he says, I cannot conceive a god unless is existing any more than I can a mountain without a valley, yet, just as it does not follow that there is any mountain in the world, merely because I conceive a mountain with a valley, so likewise, though I conceive god is existing, it does not seem to follow on that account that god exists, for my thought imposes no necessity on things, it will be admitted that the difficulty could not be more adequately stated, but Descartes' answer is not equally satisfactory. It is most clearly formulated in his reply to the second objections to the meditations, here he says, in the idea or concept of a thing existence is contained, because we are unable to conceive anything unless under the form of a thing which exists, but with this difference that, in the concept of a limited thing, possible or contingent existence is alone contained, and in the concept of a being sovereignly perfect, perfect and necessary existence is included. Thus Descartes argues the existence of God, not on the ground that the idea of mere existence implies actual existence, but on the ground that the idea of necessary existence implies actual existence. Now no finite thing of which I have an idea has more than contingent existence, for I can always imagine that such a finite thing was never created, for example, I can imagine a demon without knowing that he exists. But it is impossible to conceive the necessarily existing being as perhaps non-existent. In other words, Descartes here teaches that the idea of God as existing differs from the idea of a finite thing as existing, say, the idea of a mountain, since to the idea of a finite thing belongs merely the idea of contingent, created existence, whereas to the idea of God belongs that of necessary existence. But this argument merely pushes back the difficulty without meeting it. My idea of God does indeed, as Descartes shows, differ from my ideas of finite things herein, that it includes the idea, not of possible, but of necessary, existence. But my idea of God nonetheless can contain only the idea of necessary existence, in other words, from my idea, even of the necessarily existing actual necessary existence cannot be directly inferred. There remain Descartes' causal arguments for the existence of God. The first of these, it will be remembered, urges that God must exist on the ground that I possess the idea of God, and that God only could cause this idea in my mind. This argument, as was shown, involves three assumptions. The first of these, that every phenomenon has some cause, may be admitted. The second and third assumptions are these. That the ultimate cause of every finite reality must be a. formal, that is, not idea, and b. no less perfect than its effect. It should be noted that Descartes admits the existence of finite causes which are objective and are also unlike their effects. And our experience confirms his admission. On the one hand, my fear may be due to my imaged idea of a burglar, and my resolve to walk to the city, to my anticipated need of coal. And on the other hand, observation furnishes us with countless examples of a cause unlike the effect. Descartes himself points out, in another connection, that corporeal motion has effects so unlike itself as sensations of sound, color, and pain. But in spite of the frequent occurrence of finite causes which are mere ideas, Descartes is justified in the teaching that an ultimate, a self-sufficient, cause could not be mere idea, for an idea is, as he might say, a mode not a substance, that is, the occurrence of an idea implies the existence of some being whose the idea is. Similarly, in spite of instances of causes unlike effects, Descartes is right in holding that an ultimate, or total cause, must be as perfect as its effect. An idea he says, may give rise to another idea, but we must in the end reach a cause in which all the reality that is found objectively in these ideas, is contained formally. It is however evident, on Descartes' own admission, that before he can prove that God exists actually, and not merely an idea, and that God has attributes corresponding with those of the idea of God, he must prove that an ultimate cause of every finite reality necessarily exists. It will be pointed out, in the following pages, that Descartes does not fully establish this proposition. Descartes' last proof argues for God as necessary cause of myself. To this end Descartes attempts to disprove successively the possibilities that I myself, that any other being less perfect than God, and that any group of beings could have produced me. In the first of the subordinate conclusions of this argument by elimination, Descartes, in the opinion of the writer, is correct. It is indeed impossible to hold in the face of my utter unconsciousness of such a relation, that I cause myself. Descartes next argues, it will be remembered, that a being less than God could not have caused me. For this conclusion, he offers two arguments, of which the less important is the statement that no being, less perfect than God, could be the permanent in preserving, or, in Descartes' term, the conserving, cause of me. This argument assumes, 1, that everything has not merely a cause, but a conserving cause, which exists along with its effect, 
and, two, that finite causes cannot be conserving causes. But the first of these positions cannot be sustained. It is not clear that every cause must be a conserving cause. The friction of two bits of wood may light a fire which goes on burning long after the sticks have been thrown aside. In fact, the combustion of every moment may be said to have its cause in the conditions of the preceding moment. Observation thus substantiates what Descartes names impossible. The dependence of one moment and its content on a previous moment in the contents of the earlier moment. There is no need, then, to examine the assumption that finite causes may not be conserving causes, since Descartes has failed to prove the necessity of the conserving cause. Descartes argues finally that God, and no being less than God, must because of me, since, as he teaches, every finite reality must have an ultimate cause, and since no finite being can be ultimate. Evidently, this argument is further reaching than the others. For if it be true that there exists an ultimate cause, then from its ultimacy we may argue, what Descartes has not succeeded in proving directly, that it is a conserving cause and an all-perfect being. It is necessary, therefore, to examine the argument with a special care. Descartes is, in the first place, unquestionably right in insisting that every finite reality, because finite, has itself a cause, and that it is, therefore, incomplete, dependent, in a word, not ultimate. For, as he recognizes, only a self-sufficient being can be ultimate. The cogency of his argument turns, therefore, on the validity of its major premise, every finite reality, must have an ultimate cause. If this be true, then there must indeed exist an ultimate cause of me, who am a finite being. We turn, therefore, to the reasoning by which Descartes seeks to establish this proposition. We find him arguing for an ultimate cause which is also a first cause. There must be a first cause of me, this is the implication of his argument, for if the cause of me were finite, it also would require a cause, finite or infinite. And if the cause of the cause of me were finite, it too would require a cause, finite or infinite, and so on ad infinitum. And such an infinite regress Descartes holds, is impossible, hence there must be a first cause, that is, an uncaused cause, which is self-caused, self-sufficient, ultimate. The difficulties with this argument are the following, in the first place, the conception of a first cause involves a contradiction. For that which is first is, by hypothesis, a temporal reality, and it is the nature of everything temporal to be necessarily connected with a past as with a future, in other words, when we proceed from stage to stage in a temporal series, we must conceive it as extending endlessly, and have no reason to assume any first cause. And in the second place, so long as we think of the cause of a finite reality as belonging to a temporal, or indeed to an anywise conditioned series, we have no right to conceive it as ultimate, or self-sufficient, for every term, even the first term, of a series is in some sense conditioned by all the others, whereas an ultimate cause must be unconditioned. Descartes' conception of a first cause which is ultimate is really therefore an attempt to combine the irreconcilable. We must conclude that Descartes has not proved, from the alleged impossibility of an endless series, that a finite reality must have an ultimate cause. He has, however, made definite the conception of a self-sufficient, an ultimate cause, and he has apprehended, more by insight than by reasoning, that the ultimate is implied by the finite, the unlimited by the limited. Later thinkers will establish this insight, will argue cogently for the existence of an ultimate reality, which is not indeed first, or temporal, cause, but which is yet ground or explanation of me. We have reached, then, the last stage of Descartes' argument, his attempted disproof of the possibility that several causes concurred in my production. To this, Descartes makes the objection that a combination of causes could not possibly have endowed me with the idea, which I possess, of God's unity. But the assumption made by this argument surely is not beyond challenge. Not only have we instances of a composition of mechanical causes followed by simple effect, but, by Descartes' own admission, I have the consciousness of myself as one. Granting then that I had gained from different causes all the other parts of my conception of God, I might conceivably add to these the idea of unity gained from self-observation. Descartes does not even consider this possibility. All Descartes' arguments, ontological and causal, for the existence of God, have thus been reviewed, with the acknowledgement that criticism at this early stage of philosophical study is, in the nature of the case, inadequate. If the criticisms on these arguments are valid, it results that the arguments, as they stand, do not prove the existence of God. Of course it by no means follows that God does not exist, for it is always possible that a correct doctrine is based on an invalid argument, and it is even possible that Descartes' reasoning was more cogent than his formulation of it. Thus the writer of this book questions the validity and the adequacy of Descartes' doctrine as he states it, yet agrees with him, not only in a general way in his conception of God's nature, and in the conviction that it is possible to establish the truth of God's existence, but in the conviction that God is necessarily the existing explanation of the universe. See Descartes' inadequate arguments for the existence of other finite realities. 
the admission of the failure of Descartes' argument to prove the existence of God carries with it consequences of the gravest import to Descartes' system. For on the truth of God's existence depends, for Descartes, the truth that spirits, other than myself, and external objects exist. He argues the existence of spirits and objects alike, on the ground of God's veracity, and his argument loses all its force, if the very existence of a voracious God is uncertain. There are other reasons for rejecting Descartes' attempt to prove the existence of material things from the veracity of God. For Descartes himself impugns the veracity of God by admitting that we are deceived in our belief that external objects are not merely extended, but colored, fragrant, and tangible as well. To be sure, he attempts to reconcile the inconsistency by insisting that we are not clearly and distinctly conscious of any quality save extension, and by admitting that God allows us to be in error in the case of our obscure and confused consciousness. We are often, Descartes admits, at fault in our judgments about the color, the fragrance, or the texture of objects, but we have, he insists, a clear geometrical knowledge of their space relations. We have, for instance, a clear and distinct conception of the cubic contents of an object, whereas we are not certain how to name the color. But this attempted reconciliation will not bear analysis. The peculiar certainty of mathematical propositions has already appeared to be of two types. 1. I am certain that a mathematical truth exists in the sense that I am actually conscious of it, and 2. I am certain that one mathematical quantity is identical with another. But both these kinds of clear conception and consequent certainty have to do with ideas, not with corporeal realities. And from the fact that I have a clear idea of a cubic content, it no more follows that the cubic content corporeally exists than it follows from my idea, confused or clear, of green color, that the color corporeally exists. In the second place, it may be objected that if any of our errors imply God's deceitfulness, then all must imply it. For, according to Descartes, God is our creator and is thus responsible alike for our indistinct and for our distinct apprehension. In truth, Descartes' argument proves too much. He cannot well be right both in the teaching that we cannot be mistaken in supposing that material things exist, and in the doctrine that we must be mistaken in supposing that material things are colored and tangible. d. The inadequacy of Descartes' qualitative dualism. One general difficulty with Descartes' teaching has already been pointed out. It was the first to trouble his immediate successors, and indeed it constitutes one of the fundamental issues of philosophy. This is the problem of the relation between a spirit and what is called its body. Descartes, it will be remembered, teaches that a spiritual substance and an extended substance are realities utterly independent of each other. And yet he teaches the bodily conditions, for instance the changes of the retina and the light, affect the mind with perception, that the mind by willing causes conditions in the pineal gland, which result in the altered direction of muscular movement, and that God, who is an incorporeal being, produces matter. It is evident that such interaction between minds and bodies is quite incompatible with the asserted independence of the spiritual and the corporeal. Either a spirit and a body do not really affect each other, but in that case, God could not create corporeal objects, and objects could not cause perceptions, and the will could have no effect on bodily movements, or there are not, after all, two entirely independent sorts of reality. The attempt to reconcile these concepts forms the starting point of the philosophies immediately succeeding on that of Descartes, all of them strongly influenced by his teaching. Other criticisms, some of them trivial or unjustified, some well-founded, have been made on the system of Descartes. It is not, however, necessary to consider these criticisms of detail, seeing that there is, as has been shown, good reason to impugn the completeness or the cogency of the arguments by which Descartes seeks to demonstrate the existence of God, and with it the existence of the world outside me. Such a negative estimate of the decisiveness of Descartes' argument is entirely consistent with a deep conviction of the value of Descartes' contribution to philosophy. His most significant achievement is his vigorous teaching that the existence of a self is immediately certain and implied in every doubt, and that philosophical inference must start from this certainty. The defects of his system are due to his abandonment of this starting point, and to his adoption of other foundation principles, for example, the alleged criterion of clear thought, and the uncritically assumed law of causality. But even Descartes' defective arguments have at least the merit of stating clearly inevitable problems of philosophy. He formulates, in enduring outlines, a qualitatively dualistic, numerically pluralistic theistic system. He conceives the universe as made up of finite beings, either spiritual or corporeal, in subordination to an infinite spirit, God. He holds this doctrine neither as an unsubstantiated insight, nor as a revealed truth, but as a result of philosophic reasoning. Even when this reasoning proves unsatisfactory, Descartes does good service by so clearly stating the issues involved. Succeeding systems, as will appear, have their starting point in the attack on someone of Descartes' vulnerable positions, or in the development of the truth inherent in someone of his faulty arguments.